and yeah, we are looking forward to hearing you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. It's it's, uh, uh, it's actually so nice that you organized this uh, uh, this talk. I, I was uh, planning to be there at the City University of New York and meet all of you people in person, but uh, uh, um, some extraneous situation took place and and, uh, and uh, one nice hap is planning to come here around. So uh, I would be I would be doing this thing uh, online from Berkeley. I uh, how are you people out there? Is it cold in, in New York? Right now? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Compared to Berkeley, for sure, it's cold, right? Yeah, so, yeah. so we've gotten used to freezing temperatures, so it's all a matter of relative, uh, you know, <laughs> relativity. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. No, because, you know, uh, yesterday uh, I was engaged in this panel discussion and people were uh, complaining that, that it was pretty cold in Berkeley. And I said, uh, you have no idea how, how freezing it is in Oslo. So they were like, OK, yes, we understand you. It's all about relative uh, 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 seeing things in a relative light. So like, let's let me jump into the presentation. So uh, so my presentation, as you have it, I think in front of you, some of you, uh, perhaps or all of you, uh, it's about uh, globalization of social regulation uh, reform or social regulation policies uh, and it's a case study of Norway and India and what's the influence of ADA tracing its influence so uh, it starts um, by looking at the, the general background uh, like if you if you think about the uh, a, at a global level there are approximately almost 15 Person, people with disabilities uh, worldwide. There are there are one billion people who are disabled, uh, according to the World Health Organization. And vast majority of these people, you know, approximately 470 to 480 million people don't have employment or are underemployed or unemployed. And and these people live uh, 80 to 90 percent stay in the global south. And or we all know that the cost of not employing people with disabilities is very high. It can go to trillions of dollars. And and uh, and the idea is this that when governments know that there's a problem of unemployment among disabled people, then they kind of formulate different kinds of policies to tackle this problem. For instance, they would they would create uh, incentive system policies, they would create policies which have to do with anti-discrimination and what have you, because the broad idea of all these policies is the, is the fact that, that, that more, more and more people with disabilities should be employed, because employment is not just merely uh, required for financial independence you know or secure it, it's very very important for participating in community for for being an active citizen for being included in the society and for asserting one's voice so so it's very important to to understand it in a global context that that this unemployment or underemployment of uh, uh, disabled people is a major major challenge which is faced by governments not just in uh, in the global south but also in global north like countries like united states uh, which has you know abysmal employment rate for persons with disability it is languishing around 30 percent as compared to 65 66 percent employment rate among in the general population if you look at countries like norway the employment rate is rather poor so we'll talk more about it later and 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 the same is the case in in countries like india so moving forward if you if you, as I mentioned some moments ago, that governments can create different kinds of policies. So there is this typology of policies, which which I think is a very nice way of putting uh, understanding disability policies. So it it goes something like this: that there are three major subsystem in disability policies. The first subsystem is the social benefit subsystem. So, for instance, if you think about disability, you think about. Uh, uh, Perhaps some people will not be able to work, and since they won't be able to work, we don't fall, we don't necessarily want them to go fall through the cracks, if you will. We need some kind of safety net, some kind of support system. So for that, disability benefits are are put in place, disability pensions are put in place. So that's the first subsystem. The second subsystem is the social service subsystem, wherein not all disabled people or persons with disabilities can participate in the labor market. They, they need uh, personal assistance care. They need, uh, uh, they need uh, some forms of uh, services which will make their life easier, be it transport arrangements and so on. So that is the second category of, uh, of um, of uh, disability policy and the third policy is the social regulation policy subsystem which has to do 
primary example is the anti-discrimination uh, laws, uh, wherein the idea is to create a much more level playing field for uh, for all people in a given society and that is the subsystem which which actually is very uh, is very critical is vital it's un, it's, it's under researched uh, because uh, when it comes to disability benefits and disability services uh, people like to quantify that people like to explore that and do a lot of comparative analysis and studies uh, involving uh, involving different countries both in north america as well as in europe but when it comes to social regulation subsystem uh, discussions about anti discrimination laws whether they work they don't work and how do they get implemented in different country contexts the the research is rather scarce so when I talk about globalization of social regulations uh, I want you to keep your uh, keep that frame in your uh, in your head that I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on disability policies which are relating to anti-discrimination laws or accessibility norms or universal design principles so yes and uh, so, so it, uh, if we go a bit forward, you will see that like wh what's the most important thing from the United States? Well, what's what's its major export? One of the major export is this theoretical construction about disability, when disability is conceived as a as a minority group. Just as the way you have a racial minority, uh, you have a LGBTQI minority, you have a minority based on uh, on gender and uh, uh, and sexuality. In the same way, disability is construed as a minority, and this this whole movement took place uh, in 70s and 80s, and this movement led to the. Uh, led to the popularization of the minority model which stated that we are a minority and we need civil rights and and that kind of thinking which started in the United States uh, led to eventually the passage of Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 which one that I was referring in the beginning of the uh, of the lecture or talk or conversation uh, so if you if you go forward and if you and if you look that go deep into the uh, into the ADA, you will find that Americans with Disabilities Act has five titles, like five chapters or five major uh, buckets, if you will. Uh, and in the first title, the, the the focus is on employment of persons with disabilities because uh, ADA acknowledges uh, that uh, it's very hard for persons with disabilities to get employed. There's a lot of uh, un bias prejudice stigma uh, associated with disability and people with disabilities are not given fair enough chance to enter into the labor market so what what ada said ada said that we would provide we would uh, give opportunities for reasonable accommodation we would make sure that any employer who employs more than 15 employees in the united states will have to be ada compliant will have to make sure that they don't discriminate against persons with disabilities and if they do and they're caught doing discrimination then they could be punitive actions could be taken against them so and of course there are other titles to uh, to ada there's a title on public services public accommodation telecommunication and miscellaneous title but those titles are are not worth discussing at this moment. We could talk about it in a discussion if you want, if you want. But since our focus is predominantly about employment policies, I, I would want you to 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 understand that this aspect of reasonable accommodation is something which is very very vital. Uh, this 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 idea that that you have that your needs have to be accommodated. Uh, that if you uh, if you are a qualified person with disability and if you're called for a job interview and if you cannot enter the job interview because there there is no ramp in the building or there and or or there are stairs or there is no elevator or there's no way in which the interview could be placed on the ground floor, then then your uh, then your needs are not getting accommodated and and you could be held liable as an employer. Uh, for 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 neglect, but again, the most important uh, uh, um, fire exit, if you will, is the is the idea of um, undue uh, undue burden or unreasonable uh, or hardship, undue hardship. I think I'm I I'm not very sure about the exact legal terminology, but it, but the but the core principle is this that you cannot go to a a, a small mom and pop store and say to them that I want you to uh, to install a, uh, uh, an elevator or or, uh, or or some kind of uh, ramp which is going to cost you uh, tens of thousands of dollars uh, effectively pushing them out of business so then the that in that situation the employer can can opt out so there's a very fine line which is which is drawn but what I want you to 
take away is the idea that this that this kind of reasonable accommodation duty or or the idea of you know accessibility has to be provided to disabled people uh, are, uh, when they're searching for jobs or, or or when they are applying for jobs or when they are uh, undertaking jobs is very very important and that eventually what what happened is i'll move on to the are you people on the on the same on the same page as me or am i speaking fast or how is it going guys please sorry move closer to you yeah now i was just telling closer to the computers sure sure so so now uh, if you have any questions at any given point of time, I, uh, I hope you're keeping track of the PowerPoint and, and trying to understand or, or catch up with me that what am I saying about uh, about ADA and uh, and uh, and whatever has transpired until nineteen uh, until nineteen ninety. So uh, the research question which I which I wanted to discuss today or the idea which I wanted to discuss was how how is it that or what what to what extent has ADA influenced the policies, social regulation policies uh, in, in Norway and India. And the reason why I picked up Norway and India is because Norway and India are very different countries. And if, and if, and if ADA, uh, ADA's legacy could be traced to these two countries, then that means that ADA, ADA's legacy could be potentially be found in other countries as well, which are quite dissimilar. Yeah, so, so what are social regulations? As I mentioned some moments ago, the, these are the policies or instruments which are designed to correct, correct the market failures, to correct, uh, 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 to make sure that, that, that markets and non-governmental actors behave in a particular way, which is, uh, which is non-discriminatory, which is, uh, which is, which is uh, taking into account principles of equality, fairness, and justice. So that is that. That's that's the baseline which you have to keep in mind. And uh, when I when I talk about employment, I'm I'm generally talking about a formal sector employment, wherein which is contract driven and which is uh, which is not 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 something like uh, working uh, in a voluntary sector or working uh, working in an informal sector because often a large number of people, specifically in global south, they work in the informal sector. And uh, what I ended up doing is I ended up um, uh, conducting qualitative case study uh, wherein, wherein I, I interviewed policy experts from Norway and India. And, and, I, also, uh, and I also undertook policy uh, review uh, wherein I reviewed a lot of documents, approximately 24 documents uh, from Norway and India after the 1990, because 1990, as I mentioned, was the passage of ADA, just to see that what has happened in these two very different countries since the passage passing of ADA yeah and if you move forward as I mentioned in 1990 the the ADA was passed and the decade of 1990 is considered to be this banner decade which led to the proliferation of civil rights uh, legislation worldwide so 1992 the uh, uh, similar kind of legislations were passed in 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 Australia uh, 1995, Britain passed uh, the ADA kind of legislation, which was called as Discrimination Disability Act. Uh, Germany changed its constitution provision to make sure that you cannot discriminate on grounds of uh, disability. Similarly, other countries followed suit. And in the last decade, this number has increased to 40 countries. So what has ev eventually happened is, and why I'm bringing this back to, back to um, United States is that ADA was a primary primary trigger or it was a major milestone which led to the proliferation of rights based thinking of of this idea that disabled people or people with disabilities are equal citizens and they they need to have access to uh, labor market just as the way like any other non disabled person would want to be part of the labor market so that's very very important to keep in mind prior to that it, the, the the focus of uh, of uh, disability policies was uh, was as i mentioned on on giving disability benefits taking care of disabled people being compassionate towards uh, disabled people giving them nice services but ada came and said yes of course we need these uh, redistributive services and benefits but at the same time we need to have make sure that that uh, that the markets are sufficiently regulated so that they allow us to participate on a fair footing as compared to other people 
So as I mentioned, if you if you go to if you move forward in the slide, you will see that there's a slide where I, where I kind of outline the distinction between Norway and India, as you might be thinking that uh, it, it, Norway is this incredibly rich country on the northwestern periphery of uh, Europe, uh, the population of 5 million people, and India is this huge country in global south, a population of 1.2 billion people. Uh, uh, so so how how is this comparison even going to take place and what is what is happening and and as you see in that particular particular slide i i'm i'm explaining that these countries are, are two worlds apart on every conceivable macro level factor on economics if you look like uh, economic factor norway's gni or gross national income is somewhere close to $66,000 and india is somewhere close to $5,300 if you look at the uh, demographic factor norway Norway is an aging society where the, the average age for men is like 80 years and the women age is 84 years and India is a India is a grow young society the average age is 29 years you know the men uh, live until 64 and women until 60 or vice versa pardon me <clears throat> I'm I'm not reading I'm just uh, saying things from whatever uh, I know, so pardon me because I have not I have not access to my screen reader right now. Um, so so some so 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 you so just you you have the you have the point of reference with the PowerPoint at least, so you can check that. Uh, and uh, when it comes to uh, linguistic factors, for instance, Norway has two languages and India has uh, 22 recognized languages. If you look at uh, social factors, there's a, there's, the, the society is much more uh, inclusive. There's, there's very, very less chance for poverty and social exclusion and isolation. In case of India, there's a higher risk and chance for poverty, social exclusion. And if you think of a welfare state, Norway is an extremely generous welfare state, much more rich, rich country, as com much more richer welfare state as compared to the United States. It's social democratic uh, in its value and ethos. And India is a much more protective welfare state, wherein you know if you can only only the poorest of the poor have the have the access to uh, government's ben uh, resources and benefits. So. On every conceivable macro level factor, these countries are very, very distinctively different. And if you move forward, you will see what, what, what I'm finding is that when it comes to the employment for persons with disabilities, as I mentioned, uh, even in the United States, there is this huge disparity. Only 30% of people with disabilities approximately are employed as compared to 65%. If you look, uh, look at that slide wherein I discussed that how Norway, which is this incredible and really rich egalitarian social democratic uh, welfare state uh, is not able to tackle the problem of unemployment among amongst the disabled people it's um, the uh, unemployment rate is approximately 43 percent as compared to 75 or 76 percent in the labor market and this has been a major cause of concern for the policymakers in Nor Norwegian uh, labor market or Norwegian government Norway is regarded as a mediocre country among the rich club the OECD club the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development uh, a group uh, which is which involved which, which even has United States as a member so and if you go to India India, it's it's no surprise that the employment rate for persons with disability is really poor. It was approximately 42.7% in 1990, and it went down to 37.6% in 2002. And right now, uh, according to the last census in 2011, it's standing somewhere close to uh, 36 percent so as you see that this is downward spiral and this 36 percent is lesser than 55 percent general employment rate and the idea is this uh, well, that that these statistics are not comparable uh, but but I want you to take away this 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 um, one major uh, idea that that employment or unemployment for disabled people is a major problem doesn't matter the the socioeconomic status of the country doesn't matter the uh, the, the geographical region to which the country belongs doesn't, doesn't matter uh, the economic development or historical uh, or institutional uh, uh, trajectory which the country has followed so yeah if uh, so if you if you move forward and you'll see in the presentation that I, I, I outlined that how the disability policies uh, have 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 evolved in Norway since the early 2000 and I took early 2000 as, as a beginning point because in, in 1990 ADA was passed and after that 
as I mentioned, un until 2000, the focus of disability policies in Norway at least was that we have to take care of our disabled people. We tax our, gov our citizens so much that we have to make sure that we a portion of good amount of benefits and services for disabled people. But once when the uh, 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 2000s uh, came, the, uh, the discourse changed from welfare to re uh, and redistribution to social regulation and equality. People started demanding that we want access to uh, labor market. We want access to higher education. And, and that led to multiple universal design action plans in Norway since the mid 2000s. That led to the first Anti-Discrimination and Accessibility Act in Norway, which came, came about in 2009 and was amended in 2013. That also led to the changes in the Working Environment Act, which stated that you cannot discriminate people uh, purely on the grounds of disability. If we move to India, what happened in the Indian context since uh, uh, in 2000? Uh, in, but before we go to 2000, there's one important legislation which I would like to highlight from India, which was the first nationwide statute uh, on disability, which was the Persons with Disability Act in 1995. And this act, for the first time, cursorily talked about anti-discrimination. In 2006, national policy for persons with disability was chalked, was chalked out. Again, again, very, uh, very much aligned to the idea of uh, of the Persons with Disability Act, which was based on uh, on uh, on the principles of uh, equalization of opportunities. And this kind of discourse was non prevalent, non existent in the Indian disability policy discourse until 1995. So these are very recent developments. And then as, you, as we move forward, we find that <clears throat> in 2015, India launched an Accessible India campaign, the government, and, and there, is, there is this focus which, which suddenly uh, emerged that, that we need to create accessible public spaces. We need to provide some kind of uh, recourse for disabled people to participate, not just in the labor market, but also in society. And in 2016, the Indian government uh, passed the right of Persons with Disabilities Act. And this act, for the first time, outlined the principles of reasonable accommodation, which was kind of, as I said, not non-existent. So the thing which was outlined in the United States in 1990, finally, eventually, out, after a lot of hoops, reached India in 2016. So <clears throat> uh, as I mentioned, that there has been this expansion of social regulations uh, in these two countries. If you move forward in the presentation, you will see that, uh, that I talk about uh, uh, similar sticks, carrots, and sermons. That's my, uh, my research article, which, uh, wherein I discuss that how these two significantly different countries, despite their inherent differences and distinctions, have, have, have formulated have formulated similar sticks, sticks referring to legislate, legislation uh, provisions, like as I mentioned, the Anti-Discrimination Act, or the Rights of per from Norway and the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act from India, and uh, and they have come up with uh, these accessibility norms and universal design principles in both these countries, which are so different when it comes to all all conceivable factors. And then I and I also talk about carrots and sermons, which uh, which in part are are um, carrots referring to subsidies and tax incentives in uh, which Norway provides to its uh, to its employers to hire more disabled people and India does the similar kind of uh, has similar kind of provisions and and sermons are are the ideas uh, relating to giving handing out awards sharing of best practices and 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 getting employers to to come together to uh, to make sure that the labor market becomes a bit more inclusive uh, and, uh, and and diversity is appreciated and disability is included in the, in the diversity discourse so this this is this is until now and then if you move forward i i try to explain that why did these two very different countries have led to similar social regulation reforms and i enlist three major factors 
and the three major factors are, I think, where you'll be able to see the, the three pictures uh, there. Uh, the first picture is about the trend towards international harmonization. The second picture is the trend towards el elite networking. And the third picture is the idea of uh, uh, grassroots mobilization. So international harmonization is this, is this concept which states that common responses are require common solutions or sorry, pardon me common problems require common solutions because because we are facing this problem of discrimination in the labor market and that's why it's important that countries come together band together and 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 come up with directives uh, uh, provisions wherein they say that discrimination is not going to be prohibited uh, permitted in the labor market that kind of uh, developments have taken place uh, i'm not sure whether how how well you are versed with the idea of united nations conventions on the rights of persons with disabilities uh, which uh, came in 2006 7 we could talk a bit about it in the q a uh, or the european union directives and these two instruments supranational or interna international global instruments have led to phenomenal pro pro proliferation of rights-based discourse or social regulations or anti-discrimination based thinking around the world uh, since the early 1990s and if you take a couple of steps back you'll be able to trace that all roads lead to ada yeah so that's the, that's the first <clears throat> uh, first factor which which has led to this uh, policy convergence in case of norway and india uh, and if you look at the uh, the product question of elite networking the sharing of best practices uh, it's it's a pretty intuitive idea that that elites are this group of people who are able to share uh, who are able to travel from one country to another country to different attend different conferences write papers and learn from each other and bring those ideas from uh, from uh, different countries back to their own countries so when i was interviewing policy experts many experts said to me that uh, uh, they, they got inspired from the passage of ADA. Some of them uh, physically traveled to United States to see how the ADA is working, to see how the Center for Independent Living S Systems are working in the United States. And they went back to, their, uh, to Norway and India and said, we need, to, we need to change our laws, we need to mobilize people. So that kind of uh, uh, rights-based tourism, that's what is uh, it's called by uh, Catherine Heyer. She's one of the persons whom I, I refer, uh, is, has, has led to, has led to uh, the proliferation of anti-discrimination based thinking. And the third and the most important uh, uh, important picture is the picture at the bottom which says nothing about us without us. So what's that? As it says intuitively, it's about representation, it's about ownership, it's about taking control of one, of, of their own uh, needs and expectations. So th this, this whole movement where disabled people band together and said we will fight for our rights, this idea again got, uh, uh, got uh, crystallized uh, in AD because ADA was was a grassroots uh, movement, uh, uh, which ADA. ADA was an outcome of a grassroots movement, and once when ADA got uh, uh, got passed in 1990, uh, the disability rights activists in Norway and India said that that if if United States can pass ADA, then we can also band together, we can also come together, collaborate with each other, and and ask for equality and justice and fairness, and 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 uh, ask for the uh, policies to combat discrimination. So if you move forward, you will see that I give these timelines about the first factor the trend towards international harmonization and i am uh, and, and and i'm starting the timeline in norway from uh, from the un standard rules and i talk about the european disability strategy so these two instruments took place in 1993 and 1996 and you know the precursor to this instruments was the americans with disabilities act in 1990 and then if, uh, uh, as you move forward, you see in 1997, Amsterdam Treaty was passed, which said that you cannot discriminate based on disability. 2000, where there was this idea that uh, uh, European Union said, uh, passed a directive saying that discrimination based on disability will be prohibited uh, and it will be an offense. Which, which was the first time in the history of EU that that kind of directive was passed. And that led to an immediate change of uh, Working Environment Act in Norway in early 2001-2, which, as I mentioned some moments ago, led to the Anti-Discrimination Accessibility Act in 2009-10, and also which led to the proliferation of the ideas relating to universal design and accessibility. Uh, 
in Norway. If you if you move one more slide forward, you will see what happened in India. Again, 1990, AD was a starting point. 1992, uh, there was this uh, Asia and Pacific decade of disabled people, which which said that we need to treat disabled people with equi uh, on equitable grounds. They have to be become full and effective citizens, and uh, and and that led to, as I mentioned in some moments ago, also the 1995 Persons with Disabilities Act, which was the first nationwide statute, and that act was not, would not be possible if the ADA would not have gone would not have gone through. So it's it, there. There is this there is this clear linkages if you if you can trace back to ADA. <clears throat> And as you see, in 2015, 2016, the Accessible India campaign in 2015 and the Rights of Persons with Disability Act in 2016 emerged out of the fact that then India signed and ratified the UNCRPD in 2007. And if you look at the UNCRPD language, it is it is using the ideas from ADA, like the reasonable accommodation or or or, or ideas concerning anti-discrimination and preventing people uh, from discriminating based on grounds of disability. And 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 that those these these developments are really fundamental when it comes to supranational or international uh, uh, harmonization trends. If you, if you move forward, you'll see, this, uh, you'll see this influence of elite networking. And as I mentioned, the third point of that would be very vital for you to see. Like uh, uh, the, first, the first two points are relating to writing of reports, that how these elites and experts from different walks of life write reports for different multilateral organizations like the International Labor Organization, like the United Nations, and, uh, and, 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 they, and they share best practices. They, they go and attend seminars and conferences which are organized by these organizations and, and, and they do undertake this socialization wherein they travel to United States, pick up these fantastic ideas and take it back to, to their respective countries. So this came up as a very powerful way of diffusion of ideas and best practices. So <clears throat> that's how elite networking influenced the really, uh, uh, really shaped the disability policy landscape in, in Norway and India. And if you move forward and you'll see the grassroots mobilization, uh, there would be another table which, which, which discusses that how, how, these, how, how disabled people started talking about more uh, on the lines of uh, regulations, more on the lines of equality, fairness, and justice, and, and perhaps put the welfare, charity-oriented uh, uh, discourse a bit on the back burner. And, and in Norway, <clears throat> uh, the, the, this is an interesting point for, from a social work point of view or from a social policy point of view that disabled people and their organizations have a very congenial relationship with the state. Because as I mentioned, that state in Norway, uh, the welfare state is very generous. It gives a lot of benefits, a lot of services to disabled people. So as the old adage goes, that you don't bite the hand which feeds you. So that's why the, the, the disabled people and their organizations are not very, uh, follow a very co uh, collaborative, benign, positive approach towards the, <clears throat> towards the government. But when it comes to India, as, as, I, as uh, you might assume, uh, the relationship is rather confrontational. It's pretty much like the way, uh, uh, the way a relationship of disabled people and their organizations is, uh, is in the United States. Many, many DPOs like ADAPT and, uh, and, uh, um, and CILs were very, very, when they were formed, uh, they, uh, they had to fight really hard. Uh, they were, they were sit-in, there were protests, there were, uh, there were blockages there were direct actions uh, which took place in the United States. So India kind of follows that trajectory of, of, of activism. Uh, and, 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 the, and the idea is if the government is not able to provide for services, and if the government is not able to enforce the law, then let us go and sue the company, sue the government. Uh, and, and that kind of approach is pretty much influenced from the ADA-based thinking. So uh, as I mentioned that all these, all these activities have led to, led to the fact that these organizations who were previously neglected, these people who were previously neglected, are now starting to get representation at different, uh, at local, state, regional, and national and international levels. And this is very important uh, development. And because of their representation, 
intonation and their voice uh, now they are able to affect change and that then as i mentioned uh, a couple of times that anti-discrimination law accessibility law in norway which was passed in 2009 uh, along with the amendments to working environment act and along with the uh, universal design action plans all of this was possible in part because of this grassroots mobilization which was in part influenced by ADA and 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 the pa and, and how the ADA was passed and the similar kind of trajectory was followed in India the persons with disabilities act and the rights of persons with disability act and the accessible india campaign all these things in part could be traced to could, could be traced to the the passage of ADA and now moving on to the final concluding slide, where not, because I would like you to ask questions and engage with me in a in a in a conversation after this. So the the idea is pretty simple that 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 there are these that there's this common perception now uh, uh, that there are common problems which exist around the world the unemployment amongst people with disabilities the uh, the uh, discrimination which is prevailing in the labor market the lack of access which disabled people have to uh, to the labor market be it uh, be it in accessibility of in infrastructure be it <clears throat> in accessibility of public transport or ICT system and all these things have led to the uh, led to the popularization of social regulation policies and as I mentioned that this social regulation policies which are designed to create a level playing field for for people it's possible only because of two things because of the effects from the top that is the that is the uh, international harmonization and elite networking uh, uh, people working at the supranational level intra international level the united nation level and people working at the grassroots so there is this incredible spiral dynamic which is at play wherein the top influences the the grassroots and the grassroots influences the top and 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 because of this because of these developments which of course started in united states uh, 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 has led to the proliferation of social regulation policies in uh, in these two very distinctively different countries. And 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 my hypothesis is this: that if the policies in these two different countries are converging or are becoming similar, or if these two very different countries are following a similar policy trajectory, uh, that is towards in, uh, towards making anti-discrimination laws uh, uh, create working towards uh, achieving reasonable accommodation duties or enforcing accessibility norms or universal design principles <clears throat> it is important to uh, to see that perhaps this trend is is not just uh, it's not a local trend it's a it's a global trend so that's why the title uh, of the of the lecture was globalization of social regulations and there's a question mark so i would I would like uh, that to be perhaps answered uh, or or be thrown out uh, in uh, into the epistemic community and and they can s search it and uh, research about it and uh, and either confront that hypothesis or vindicate it or, or or prove it wrong. And as I say in the end, like I want, I always like to end my presentation uh, with this beautiful lines from Robert Frost the road uh, less traveled because um, when I <clears throat> when I uh, try to compare the when I started this project of comparing these two different countries people told me that you will not find anything worthwhile comparing uh, how can you even think of comparing uh, a country like Norway to India Gagan you should compare uh, uh, apples with apples don't compare apples with oranges you know compare norway to sweden to denmark to iceland to united states and compare india to mozambique and tanzania and and the countries from the global south and uh, and i said to uh, i listened to whatever they said and i uh, and i took uh, took their concerns into account and uh, but, I, but I did not stop and uh, finally um, the things are working in the right direction and and uh, and this research is gaining a lot of traction, not just in uh, in Scandinavia, but also in the United States and in Europe in general. <clears throat> so uh, two roads diverged in the woods, and I took the uh, road less traveled, and that has made all the difference. Thank you, everybody. It's certainly, uh, you know, um, scary, but more productive, right, to, to kind of follow your own path. So, uh, thank you so much for sharing that, and I wanted to just open it up. Yes.
no one knew. Because they all read up on ADA and we've been like critiquing ADA all this while. Uh-huh. Here. So if you want, no, all this while we were thinking ADA is bad. <laughs> as bad things or it hasn't been implemented in the way it was designed yes. a lot of and, yes. and but you know it's also interesting to hear that it has inspired a generation of disability legislation across the world absolutely so, I, so, yeah. I, I... Uh, I think in one of the slides I mentioned this as a that this as a uh, uh, I think the slide is called as the uh, influence of ADA. I think it's slide number five or six, wherein I say the the bullet there's a bullet point which says the employment rate has remained stagnant at thirty percent, and the international but the however the international influence of ADA far outreaches as compared to the domestic influence. So you're spot on one now that that uh, perhaps uh, in the domestic uh, scheme of things ADA uh, ADA and employment has not uh, the employment rate has not nudged and uh, the uh, the desired outcomes have not been reached but uh, but uh, as I mentioned like many many countries uh, distinctively different countries have come up with or have adopted these laws yeah yes Yes. Uh, this is very costly for the for the employers, and it's not really reasonable for every company to hire. Yes. That cost them to uh, rent a new place that equip to service people with disability. So how can you force this uh, reasonable accommodation into employers? It will will the country be able to fund some type of I don't know. How can you make the place uh, uh, reasonable for people with disability? Hmm. Uh, elevators or uh, sometimes bathroom has to be also equipped with the. Uh, you know, uh, so will the country intervene and supply these employers with some type of benefit or money or fund to make the place reasonable for them? Or this is going to be the employer himself? Or will they at least take some tax out? How can if they hire? What percentage to hire? And what they gonna do to uh, the company to hire a person with disability? Especially in the Indian context, I guess that would yes. be relevant. Yes. Well, even question. here, even here too, because they say if you have a team complete, you must have a accessible space, which is reasonable for those who have. Mm. Yes. Or have they make this work? Yes. No, you are spot on. Like uh, that's a very good question. Thank you for asking that. Uh, you you remember I gave this uh, 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 similar sticks, carrots, and sermons. So carrots are the things which you are referring to right now. Carrots refer to the financial incentives to the companies to to make sure that companies fi- companies find the disabled employee, a prospective disabled employee, to be attractive enough to be hired. For instance, so uh, so in case of Norway, uh, there, there, there are these there, there are these carrots. For instance, uh, if you if you change uh, a change like for instance, a person needs some special kind of lighting arrangement. A person needs screen reader. Uh, a, a blind blind uh, a prospective blind employee, or uh, or a person needs uh, a, a ramp and so on. Like you can ask the government uh, for a facilitation guarantee or facilitation subsidy which can help uh, the employer cover part of its cost for instance you know uh, I, I don't know the exact figures but there are these arrangements that still exist in in Norway in case of India for instance as I mentioned uh, in part that uh, that in Indian state or government does not have too much of uh, financial muscle it's 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 a developing country as compared to Norway which is an extremely developed and rich country but still you can find traces of the same logic for instance uh, 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 what Indian government says is if you hire 
hire or recruit a person with disability uh, every uh, every employee who is who is recruited uh, there has to be kind of a social security contribution which the employer has to make for this employee every month or every year so if this if, if hypothetically speaking if the employer has to pay hundred dollars every month for for social security for an employee uh, who is hired and in a particular salary bracket and it, if it accounts to twelve hundred dollars so what the government is saying i will pay this twelve hundred dollars for three years for you if you promise that you'll hire um, uh, hire a person with uh, disability so so these kind of this kind of uh, uh, quasi incentive structures are are, are existing uh, in the uh, in in both the um, uh, countries but again the important thing is this that you you have to understand that that person like employers have tremendous amount of skepticism when it comes to recruiting people with disabilities there are two kind of barriers which 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 employers generally find and this 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 is applicable i think around the world first is the cost related barrier uh, because employers as you mentioned would want to know uh, uh, that what will be the cost of hiring this person uh, will i have to create a ramp will, will i have to change the lighting will i have to uh, get special furniture or special fixture so that the person or will have to uh, widen the door of, of the of the uh, establishment so that the wheelchair could enter these kind of questions are are, are really important and the second quest, uh, barrier is the barrier of productivity employers are not very sure that 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 they would if they hire a person with disability the person will not fall sick in a, uh, a sick uh, the person will uh, uh, will will be productive enough like any other quote unquote non-disabled employee so it is so so these concerns have to be assuaged uh, uh, by the governments and and you're right that that reasonable accommodation costs are are, are always are, are always a sticking point uh, and that's the reason why undue hardship clause is there in the Americans with Disabilities Act as I mentioned it's kind of like a fire exit which helps uh, uh, perversely many employers to to shrug off and say this is not my responsibility I cannot fulfill this responsibility but what research has shown in the past <clears throat> Uh, uh, past 20 years of a passage of ADA is that more than majority of the costs of uh, of uh, of accommodation uh, is le uh, is less than $500 more than 90% or 95% of cost is less than $500 and the remaining 5% cost is around $2500 to $3000 I could give you a couple of names uh, uh, whose work you should of course check if you are really interested in this there's a, there's a professor called as Peter Blank Peter as Peter and blank B L A N C K, uh, B for Bravo, L for Lima, A for Alpha, N for Norway, C for Charlie, K for Kilo. Uh, Peter Blank has done phenomenal work uh, discussing all these very intricate and nuanced aspects about about uh, ADA reasonable accommodation accessibility uh, uh, costs and uh, and why ADA has not worked so I would invite you to 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 explore his uh, um, his work further thank you yeah um, Marge. Uh, I, I'm sorry I cannot hear you could you please speak a bit loudly Thank you. 
and even that they had a lot of like the people that uh, with disability that fight for um, get the democracy. They did, they did complete, and it's one of the countries that has better accessibility than the whole world. And it's a third world country. You know, I just want you to know this. Uh, no, thank you. Which which country are you talking about? I'm sorry, I missed that, please. Uh, Ecuador, yeah. Uh, Ecuador, yeah. I, I think the, uh, the the president of Ecuador is a person who has a disability. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Jo yes. That's correct. Yes. So, uh, so, yeah. so that that is pretty obvious. You know what happens is the that as they say that only the shoe wearer knows where the shoe pinches. So, so, exactly. so, 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 so the so, so, so the fact that you know. President before that, he has a lot of like. Um, you know, inclusion. A lot of people they fight because they want to include people with disabilities. Yes. Cooperation by keeping a lot of changes. Yes. Actually, uh, it's 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 very interesting that you that you bring this uh, bring this up, and uh, because uh, Peter Blank, the, the the professor whom I mentioned, uh, he has a very close partnership with Ecuador, and 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 he created uh, one of the first uh, universally designed buildings, or worked on the project uh, along with, alongside the president of of Ecuador, uh, and uh, yeah, you should. I would invite you to check uh, uh, check Peter's work. You know, you might find it in, interesting and fascinating that how ideas are are, are being shaped. And, and when you mentioned about the penalties and so on, uh, as, I, as I said, that that's the example of the sticks, you know, which I mentioned, the regulative stick, that if you don't do this, I'm going to attack you with penalties and fines and, and, uh, and, and then there would be public shaming. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I wanted to know where do you think disability policy is going, or where do you see progress in the next decade for India, Norway, and the US? Uh, I, I think it is heading towards more social regulations. You know, I I, I I'm of an opinion that um, that finally, as I as I told you, this reasonable accommodation idea, which was which which started in the United States in 1990, uh, has uh, reached Norway in 2009, uh, 13, and, and reached India in 2016. So now the, the the most important thing is this: when you think about disability policies, uh, it's one thing to have the policy, and it's 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 quite a different thing to to actually implement the policies to get the change going through and 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 this is where now the major crux of the uh, 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 or the major meat of the uh, argument would be like Previously, we did not even have a disability policies. Previously, there was no recognition that disabled people had equal rights to labor market, to society, uh, and and they had to be treated equally. Uh, and um, ADA changed that narrative, and and slowly but surely that narrative uh, has reached uh, Norway and India. And now the idea is to make sure that how substantive change can take place. Because finally, we have received, we have reached a kind of a formal. Uh, a uh, formal change wherein uh, or parity at uh, at the level of um, at the level of law or legislative provisions or statutory provisions which exist in these countries so so that's very good positive first step but now the next decade will have to we'll have to see that how these incredibly progressive laws are being implemented under the uh, under the canopy of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities which was passed in 2007 or which was <clears throat> And, 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 and one should take heart from the fact that almost 180 countries signed and ratified this convention. It, uh, this, this was the first convention of 21st century. And this is phenomenal, knowing that it has, it's, it's just been there for 12 years. So many countries are very serious to take care of persons with uh, disabilities within their society. Many countries are starting to realize that persons with disabilities are persons first. They, they can be customers. They can be uh, family members. They can be stakeholders. They can be business owners entrepreneurs and they can be inventors so it's very important to to now capitalize on the fact that we have these incredibly robust 
uh, uh, laws and uh, and the and the important challenge or the important um, uh, struggle would be to ensure that these laws get implemented uh, in, in in different countries and and countries support each other in this implementation process and and uh, as they say you know like uh, let the uh, with, with with rising tides all the boats will rise as well hopefully I hope I answered your question. Oh wow, that's that's a hard one. Biggest because you know, like uh, uh, superlatives are always hard to uh, hard to you know uh, explain. Uh, so uh, so so in my case, the 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 major there is a lot of talk about accessibility in the United States, which is fantastic, but I think we still are having huge attitudinal barriers, incredibly huge. Uh, for instance, I was I was reading a report which came out from Perkins, which is the place where Helen Keller went. Uh, it's on the it's on your side of the world, on the East Coast, Perkins School of for the Blind, and 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 the and it was kind of a survey which was done uh, uh, across the entire United States. They they surveyed almost thousand people from the Midwest, from the North, uh, from the East Coast, West Coast, from North South, different age groups, generations, Generation X, Y, Z. Uh, different uh, di from from different uh, uh, places and uh, and I they wanted to understand that what kind of attitudes are uh, are are there around uh, blindness or low vision and as as you know for instance I am severely vision impaired I use a screen reader and 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 I was of an opinion that United States would be a much more enlightened society uh, uh, and attitudes in the United States would have been a lot better uh, uh, for blindness and I would invite you to read that report if you just search for Perkins survey you'll be shocked to see that in the United States there is huge huge amount of discomfort fear apathy stereotyping prejudice against people who are blind and vision impaired people don't want to people don't want to be around people who are blind and vision impaired people people don't think that blind and vision impaired people could be uh, could be employed they uh, they could be they could have families they could have uh, uh, you know uh, um, uh, you know like you, you could date a blind and visually impaired guy or a girl so that kind of um, uh, that 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 was a really serious shock for me, you know, because I anticipated it to be uh, 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 to be a, a much much more emancipated story. And what I have realized in in this past six months, while during my stay on the West Coast, is that attitudinal barriers are a major major obstacle still. And there's and there's a lot of work which still needs is is left uh, to be done in the United States. Giving the example, for instance, from Norway, you know, um, which which again will, will, will drive home my point so uh, so again my, my point of departure was okay in the Indian context you know poor attitude towards persons with disabilities exist because India Indian society is very traditional it is very, it, it, it's not as inclusive as enlightened there is this hierarchy of caste and uh, there is this uh, um, there, 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 are, there, are, there are a lot of exclusionary mechanism which are already in play in the society so of course blind and visually impaired people or people with disabilities are are, are marginalized excluded and are, and, are, and are stereotyped and prejudiced and not treated well taken but again the idea was is that perhaps Norway would be better you know Norway this incredible uh, snowflake on the tip of the iceberg society you know this incredibly wealthy five million people um, uh, one of the richest countries in the world extremely enlightened uh, human rights oriented society uh, and what I found <clears throat> specifically about blindness or low vision or vision impaired people was like there was a survey which was done in 2006 in Norway uh, uh, by a company and, 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 and they asked these prospective employers so if you are a prospective employer and I come to you as a surveyor and I give you a laundry list of people and say uh, what's your name by the way what is your name um, Lucia La Lucia. So if I ask you, Lucia, uh, uh, Lucia, I give you a laundry list of uh, of people, and I say, Lucia, what is the probability that you will hire from this from this group of people? You know, uh, and uh, and uh, and and the only decisive factor is their level of education. 
and, and qualification, okay? And I give you a long list. So, so the list consists of people who are, uh, who are on wheelchair, people who are blind, people who are, uh, are, are, are Somali, uh, Somalian immigrants, people who are ex-convicts, people who are deaf, people who are uh, long-term unemployed. And the result of the survey came out, and what, what was most shocking for me to understand is that you, Lucia, as an employer, would like to hire in Norway a person, uh, a person who is an ex-convict, or a Somalian immigrant with a lower education and qualification background as compared to a blind person with a guide dog with higher educational qualification background. And this is happening in Norway in 2006, 2008. So again, driving back to, your, uh, the, to the point that, there are, that there's a plethora of barriers you know, which exist across, uh, uh, across the spectrum which disabled people encounter. Access, accessibility of uh, infrastructure being one, uh, uh, you know, discrimination in the labor market. But one of the things which is which is really hard and sticky and uh, and which requires serious work uh, at multiple levels, right from the grassroots to the policymaker level, is the is how best to fight against prejudice, stigma, stereotyping, uh, ignorance, and and preconceived notions. Question about the UN. I mean, UN has filed many uh, international legislation, yes. but it has signed the UN. <laughs> yes, yes. There is that, uh, and there are, and UN convention. You know, maybe you can talk a little bit about that also. Yes. It's very robust. Absolutely. Um, then you know, uh, ADA. Yes. And it brings in all these legislations together. In where do you see, or why do you think uh, U.S. has not, uh, you know, there's this kind of uh, U.S. exceptionalism <laughs> that also reflects in it not signing? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, 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 I had a good fortune of spending time with uh, Senator Tom Harkin just uh, 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 last November. I was on the East Coast in Washington D.C. and uh, and uh, uh, we were talking about the ADA and and. and 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 we uh, cursorily talked about the uh, uh, and uh, uh, Senator Tom Harkin was the was the person who 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 championed for ADA in the Senate in 1988 who wrote the who wrote uh, the ADA and promoted it and 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 was a phenomenal force uh, uh, to to get the ADA passed uh, in 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 the U.S. He's a senator from or he was a senator from Iowa, uh, six-time senator or five-time senator, one of the longest-serving senator in the history of uh, United States. So. I, I, we talked on the on the sideline of a of a summit about why U.S. is uh, is not uh, able to to rise to the challenge. But and and you're right. Oh, one other the, the point which you made that 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 there is this uh, U.S. Kind of found itself in this position of of being a leader, as I mentioned, that the ADA was the first civil rights legislation, first progressive legislation, so which which offered substantive rights for persons with disabilities in the United States, and thereby influencing the rest of the world. So it it, it there is this um, there is this idea that the idea in the in the minds of policymakers that uh, we uh, we are better than the rest you know so so of course uh, in 2013 and 2012 when the efforts were made to pass that uh, legislation uh, or pass the ratification process in senate uh, it uh, it 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 kind of uh, fell apart even even despite of the fact that uh, uh, there was a progressive senate uh, or the, the, there was a progressive presidency at least uh, uh, in the united states but 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 you're right for instance if you if you people look at the uh, at at the uh, at the UNCRPD, uh, uh, it's it's a beautiful piece of document. I would I would uh, request or invite you to read that document. It's very small, small, uh, like uh, perhaps eight nine pages or so. And uh, and I would I would I would uh, like you to check out that how this talk about non discrimination is uh, is is right there in the top. You know that discrimination is bad. 
based on disability. The idea that human beings have equal dignity. All, all these things are, are, are chalked out right in the preamble, right in the beginning of, uh, of the UNCRPD, setting the tone for the societies to become more inclusive. Uh, inclusive. And, then, and then the interesting, uh, interesting uh, uh, sections would be section nine uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the treaty, which talks about the accessibility issues, which is again inspired uh, in part about, uh, from, the, from the accessibility guidelines and regulations uh, passed uh, under uh, uh, Title II and Title III of, uh, and Title IV of the Amer Americans with Disabilities Act and, and the rules and regulations surrounding it. So, so, so the idea is this, that, that, that UNCRPD takes ADA, uh, uh, ADA as a point of departure, and, a, and since it was negotiated in the United States, there was this tremendous influence by uh, and of uh, uh, U.S. Uh, policymakers, U.S. Uh, uh, activists, and, uh, and uh, uh, U.S. think tanks, uh, if you will. And, uh, and, I, and I would also invite you to read more, uh, uh, people to read more about Article 27, which talks about work and employment, and how that article gives the this gives this broad gam uh, gamut of services. It says that that state parties will have to make sure that they create an open, inclusive, and accessible labor market. And to and to do that, they must use different means. And some means might require quote unquote sheltered workshops, segregated workshops employment quotas perhaps and uh, and these kind of uh, you know like employment quotas uh, you, i know us is completely against having quotas and and that goes against the grain of anti discrimination law based thinking but this is how where you know the beauty of uncrpd lies and wherein it transcends ada is that it was able to amalgamate these influences like employment quota based thinking coming from europe and anti discrimination based thinking coming from from us and, and and, and kind of create an ecosystem or this or this visionary document which which uh, which provides a pathway for for people with disabilities uh, and uh, and and state parties to 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 kind of come up with much more progressive laws so section 19 might also be of interest it talks about independent living and it talks about the fact that how uh, uh, autonomy free choice uh, and dignity are such qu quintessential elements of human being and, and that has to be respected and and then again the moment you read that passage and if you know about the americans uh, with disabilities act or the history of united states the civil the civil rights movement from 70s 73 the 504 uh, 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 provisions which were passed uh, which state which stated in 1973 historic i'm just giving a historical perspective now wherein wherein uh, uh, united states uh, uh, th there was a there was a provision which was passed which said that if you receive any funding from uh, federal or state government then you cannot discriminate against people with disabilities in giving your goods and services. So for instance, if you are a university and if you get funding from the uh, state, then you cannot uh, discriminate uh, when it comes to high, uh, recruiting disabled uh, uh, students. And this was a huge, huge, huge milestone uh, when it comes to uh, uh, getting uh, getting much more progressive right, uh, rights uh, in, in place. So this was the precursor to ADA. And, and, if, and if you look, around that time that it was the same period when the center for independent living uh, uh, emerged or blossomed from berkeley and uh, and uh, to the to from berkeley it went to the united, uh, different parts of the united states and now there are almost 300 center for independent living uh, uh, centers around the world and 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 the idea is pretty si pretty simple that we disabled people know what's best for us what kind of services should be provided to us, and and we know how to how to uh, organize our lives, and and we want to live our life with uh, dignity and and exercise our full autonomy and choice and independence. So, the point is which I which I'm again trying to come back to now. UNCRPD is that the moment you 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 read UNCRPD, you will you if you if you know about the American disability history, uh, and if you know about the European disability history, you will, you will see that it's such an incredible document which has merged this wide-ranging perspectives from different corners of the world and 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 has come up uh, and has put uh, put a uh, put put it together in this uh, progressive uh, convention yeah
but I want to be here. How did you meet? Oh, uh, sorry. She's asking, "How do I know you? we know each other? We have a common friend in India, so, and then there's also some Twitter followers uh, at work." Yes, that's a good question. Like uh, serendipity is a good answer. <laughs> I'm I'm very happy and fortunate that I met uh, one now because you know like uh, I heard I heard about her phenomenal work and uh, and uh, um, and actually I was uh, when I when I was reading her work one of one of her articles which she has written about about uh, about Hafiz is is fantastic that how if you look at Vandana and and uh, and perhaps if you look at me many people have said to me that uh, you don't look the 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 typical Indian uh, in quotes you know you could be from south of Spain or from Latin America. America or some other part of the world, or from Jamaica. I'm like, thank you. You know that that that's that's nice to know. Uh, so uh, so uh, I so uh, to coming back to one last uh, article, the, the the idea when which she brought about that how she uh, and her her positionality is so different. You know when she goes to India, she's she's not an insider when she when she does research on disability issues. So that kind of you know sparked my interest in her work and and as she's. As she mentioned, uh, one of our common friends uh, introduced us, and I'm and I'm so glad and uh, happy that I got a chance to uh, to talk to all of you in via via Google Hangouts. But perhaps someday I'll meet you in person, all of you. I have one or two more questions, but I wanted to see if other people. Yeah, yeah, um, one question. Okay, I have three questions, so you can take the one. <laughs> one is, I mean, it's not a question; it's just discussion. We'll go one by one, just for so, me to. Uh, one is this, you know, like you mentioned about the uh, UN Convention as bringing American and European perspectives, of, like anti anti discrimination and quota system. And I think many of you may not know of quota system. Term quota system. So I think maybe yeah. uh, your people like that might be a new concept. So you know, sure. discrimination is like based on negation. You yes. cannot do this. Yes. Right? Yes. Child, like you must do this. So they both have a similar objective. Means hmm. are different. So if you can elaborate on that. Oh yes. Absolutely. So, so uh, like, think of this. Like, I would like you to, uh, to, uh, to take the clock uh, back uh, to a point where we are talking about the World War One, 1914, approximately. So, in Europe, uh, the World War One breaks up, uh, uh, breaks out, and and four years later, when the war is over, what, uh, what, what the winning parties in uh, in Europe realize that, uh, like, a lot of people got disabled in the war 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 was really brutal you know a lot of people lost their hands a lot of people lost their legs uh, they turned blind uh, they had mental health problems and so on so what happened is that when these people the soldiers who fought in these wars in france in britain in germany in parts of austria and in eastern europe when they came back they said what do we do these with these people these people were our brave souls you know we cannot let them just uh, 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 wither away or just pass uh, pa uh, we cannot expect them to just die so so that's where this idea of saying that we need to do some kind of affirmative action we need to make sure that these people now who have come back from these wars uh, and who are and who have become uh, uh, disabled are able to participate in the labor market we need to put uh, we need to make sure that society pays its dues to these people so that's where the idea of employment quotas came and 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 the idea is pretty simple if you are an employer and if you have a, a hypothetically a, a, a firm with 100 people the idea is this that out of 100 people six people have to be people with disabilities is it is it clear six people have to be with people with disabilities there's there is this fixed number of people which you must have uh, if you uh, which is proportional to your general uh, population of employees so if you have 1000 people then then the number will uh, will correspond accordingly 
so 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 that was 60 it'll become 60 so th this kind of thinking was was pretty popular in across uh, the entire europe and it kind of became even more relevant after the after the second world war which was even more devastating uh, and, and and difficult and and these quotas exist in uh, uh, almost entire Europe, majority of Europe, 20, uh, 20 countries approximately have quotas. For instance, Germany and France have the highest num highest amount of quotas. It's like 6%. Uh, so every uh, uh, company which has a certain number of employees, say 20 or 30 employees, and any company which is higher than that must have 6% of, uh, of their workforce as, disa uh, as disabled people. And if they don't do get this 6% number in their workforce, then they would be expected to pay a penalty or fine uh, as one of your co colleagues from Ecuador was mentioning so that kind of that kind of uh, was used as a stick if you will a regulative stick and uh, 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 to, to make sure that the labor market becomes a lot more inclusive and this and as uh, one was rightly pointing out that this kind of thinking the idea is again the same the idea is to get more people with disabilities into the labor market the idea is to get more people with disabilities independent and autonomous uh, uh, and 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 uh, and uh, engaged but uh, but the methodology is or the means are different it's it's like you have to do this this is a stick if you don't do it I'm gonna hit you with a stick yeah so that's what employment quota is and and in united uh, in uh, uh india there is an employment quota which was three percent uh according to the persons with disabilities act from 1995 so for instance if you are a government sector company and uh, and if you have 100 employees three percent of these employees have to be persons with disabilities out of this three percent one person had to be exclusively for persons who are blind and vision impaired one person had to be for persons who are deaf and hard of hearing and the third person had to be for persons who are physically impaired and now when the rights of persons with disabilities act came in 2016 this quota has been expanded to four percent and the fourth category is the category of people with cognitive or mental health or developmental disabilities so in Norway, there are no direct forms of quotas which exist. Uh, there, there's no employment quota. But again, Norway has a moderate form of quota, which again, it, it, it's, it's there in one of my slides when I say it's called as a preferential hiring provision. That for instance, if, if you apply for a job in a Norwegian state, uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, the, the idea is that may the best candidate win. Uh, and may the guest best candidate get recruited but when it comes to uh, uh, state sector jobs the uh, and if you have a disability you can get preference uh, over a person who is perhaps a bit less qualified uh, a bit more qualified than you are so for instance if there's a person x who is more qualified than uh, uh, than, a, than a disabled person y then you might get a chance to enter into the public sector but this quota is never discussed never used it is it it, it is there on a symbol in, in in a symbolic capacity because scandinavia like united states abhor the aspect of quota i would i would invite you uh, if you, if you if you people are interested to uh, to check out the work of uh, seminal work on employment quotas by a person called as lisa waddington l i s a waddington w a double d i n g t o n uh, and there's a there's a piece which she wrote in 1996 97 uh, it's it's a phenomenal piece about uh, employment quotas and she and she talks about all these issues which I just discussed right now uh, in part and how Scandinavia has this aversion towards quota and rest of the Europe likes it and US also hates quotas and um, and uh, also there is a report on on the on the proliferation of quota based scheme uh, in Europe if you're interested you can search for it it's from 2002 2003 you know all going to be as social workers on the field you know implementing policy yes. hopefully you know, the policy making at some level if their agencies or state policies yes so, uh, what would be you know your message to them as uh, as somebody who's been researching this policy so they, they they'll be the ones who are actually going to be implementing Oh yes, yeah. Like I, 
I think the the, uh, the ideas about uh, social work, uh, uh, it's, it's very important, for instance, to get this element of uh, social justice uh, into play uh, when it comes to conducting social work uh, and, uh, and inclusion and uh, uh, talk about this anti-discrimination. Because, because think of this, that many of the people with whom you would be dealing, like persons with disabilities, people from LGBTQI community, people from uh, people from uh, ethnic minorities, these are marginalized groups. Often these people might not know about their rights, might not know what kind of legislative recourse they have. So you have to be on top of your game, if you will, to, to really be well versed with the ideas and concepts very well uh, uh, and, and kind of champion their cause uh, in a way. Uh, um, and it, and it's and uh, there is this one person called as Chima, uh, C H I M A or C H E M A, uh, who has written a piece about social work and disability from two thousand and six. Check out that that piece. It's fantastic. It's uh, it's very very relevant. Uh, it, it it talks about how it's so important to bring this aspect of uh, of of knowledge, information, facts, uh, uh, and use it for uh, for achieving social justice and uh, and to do it in a way uh, which uh, uh, which keeps the best interest of the the client uh, in mind. But at the same time. <clears throat> You also have to understand that that you, while you're pursuing this social justice ideal, sh uh, should not at any point of time think yourself as a as a quote unquote knight in the shining armor, uh, uh, or, or or a person who's going to um, uh, uh, who's going to save the other uh, the the marginalized person uh, or. Uh, you have to kind of make sure that these uh, persons whom you are dealing with, they, they become co-participants in the process. You bring the knowledge, the, uh, the information and facts and they and give voice to their voice and, uh, and, and uh, you collaborate with them to, to affect change. And I, and I think that the role of social work cannot be uh, overstated. It's just so, so vital because you would be the, 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 the real implementers, the, the people, on, uh, people who would work on the grassroots to see whether the disability policies actually get implemented, whether the people who, who are fighting to get more dignity, autonomy uh, and choice are able to get that, whether people are, are, are able to leave their nursing homes and live their life in, uh, in, in their own, along with their own relatives and, uh, and, uh, and families family members and friends or, or whether people who are on a disability pension get a pathway towards uh, uh, towards employment and rehabilitation because often what I have also heard from by interacting with people, uh, 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 young people specifically, is that that many times rehabilitation counselors and social workers uh, could be apathetic to, uh, towards their expectations or aspirations. If if a if a blind per blind uh, young person says, "I want to undertake this higher education," then perhaps the rehabilitation counselor might say to the person, "Why why do you have to do that? Perhaps you it's not a good idea you do that. Why don't you just pick up and uh, and do something which is a bit more." Easy easy and manageable so this idea of low expectations kicks in so this is again a major major challenge which you as social workers will have to will have to be um, always grappling with that that expectations have to be set right uh, for your for your uh, clients if you will or i don't know how what, what what kind of terminology you use for the for the people whom you represent or the people whom with whom you work uh, work and and it's very important that you that you get uh, get their uh, keep their best interest in mind uh, and work with them to affect uh, to affect change and treat them as humans first and then as uh, and later on as uh, as uh, disabled or persons from other ethnic minorities Yes. I, sorry. There's one more question. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm I'm really sorry. I cannot hear you. Could you please speak up a bit, please? <clears throat> I cannot hear you. Concerning police 
police involvement um, really them being the go-to person whenever a call is called in for someone who's who's mentally ill or someone oh, yeah. who has a level of disability. And I've been coming across that these interactions turn out either violent or sometimes it causes these individuals to lose their lives. <laughs> so I'm looking into, you know, ways of how to, that's been my campaign that I'm working on. So I wanted to maybe ask you, is this something that you see or have heard or? Yes, yes. Because I'm trying to kind of figure out how bad it is. Yes. I have all the statistics on it as yet, but I'm really interested in, you know, police interaction with. Wow. Now, what's your name, if I may ask you? Stacy. Stacy? Oh, yeah, Stacey, you, you have uh, literally uh, picked up one of those very, very crucial topics. Thanks for asking this, because because if you think about uh, again, I will I will I will wind the clock back, you know, uh, about mental health um, uh, uh, disabilities. So uh, back in the day, uh, like 50, 60 years ago, <clears throat> there were dedicated institutions uh, called as you know asylum or, or uh, some other names you know which were supposed to house people with mental health issues you know and then this trend towards normalization quote unquote it emerged in Sweden and Scandinavian countries in 60s 70s and eight, uh, and 80s and so on and and the idea was this that people with mental health disabilities or intellectual disabilities have to be uh, have to be integrated to with the society they have to be uh, the, these institutions are uh, are vestiges of a, a time which uh, which was which was not which was uh, which was not commensurate with the values of late 20th century or modernity so we had to shut these institutions down of segregation and 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 exclusion and marginalization and bring um, these uh, uh, these people from the periphery to the center, uh, uh, or a, as much as we can to the center, uh, and and you're right that people with mental health disabilities are extremely marginalized and and are and are really vulnerable when it comes to violence. So uh, so as I'm sure, Stacy, you would be aware, and for other people, that almost thirty percent of uh, people with who are in, incarcerated in in the U.S. prisons are people uh, with mental health disabilities, um, uh, and and that's that's a very high proportion. Portion. And and often you know many of the people I'm I, I'm actually very <clears throat> saddened, shocked, appalled uh, when I go out in San Francisco and I see people who have serious mental health issues and they are, are out and about on the street uh, or, or or they are being uh, taken away by uh, by uh, by police. Uh, I can give you one example that I was <clears throat> walking down the street uh, with a friend of mine. This was almost four months ago uh, in, in San Francisco and, uh, and and a friend of mine happened to be this uh, 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 this blonde girl with blue eyes uh, and, and this guy uh, with whom uh, we were just walking and of course I did not see the guy. I just heard him speak and the guy was pointing at us and, and just pointing and I don't know, uh, uh, making sounds or being active and so on, and uh, and and for me it was just uh, a moment of uh, of curiosity. Uh, but after a while, when we walked back the same uh, route, uh, what what I realized that there was a police car at the same spot where the guy was there, and and my friend said to me that the guy who was making those gestures to us was being taken away by, by in a police car. So 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 you're right that this is a this is a perfect anecdote uh, to what. You you, to the question you asked and of course I cannot generalize it uh, completely but there are very serious statistics which <clears throat> which talk about this this very grave problem that how deinstitutionalization uh, led to the uh, the people with mental health issues coming back to the society but in a way uh, these people were not in properly integrated or included in the society so they ended up often being on the streets or being in the margins again and then and then um, they were they had to deal with the criminality aspect of of the whole equation so yeah it's 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 a really sad and tragic aspect and and this affects uh, minorities a lot more uh, which is again another very tragic aspect to the whole equation so yeah yeah
uh, and and uh, there is a need uh, to do a lot more. Uh, and I, I recently heard that uh, that uh, uh, prison reforms were passed in, in, in late last year. So I hope that uh, many people with mental health uh, disabilities who uh, who have been wrongfully uh, incarcerated are 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 given chance to to come out into the uh, into the mar <clears throat> into society and uh, they are uh, they are given rehabilitation and we don't treat them uh, see them through the lens of retribution thank you yeah well you're welcome and we also see that laws they are more heavily biased to the whole there's as far as inclusion of people with mental health disabilities, psychiatric disabilities, and uh, intellectual disabilities, uh, ADA, again, you know, or other international pieces of legislation are less uh, accountable mm. for, you know, that, and, or address these uh, populations within disability populations. Absolutely. Authority of disability inclusion. Yes. Yes. No, no, you're right, and that's why you know, like that point which I mentioned in one of my slides is that uh, uh, perhaps the domestic influence of ADA uh, is a bit questionable, but the international outreach is is beyond doubt that that it has been such an important uh, global changer. Uh, but again, uh, we need to come up with many more um, uh, uh, bl supporting laws, many more provisions, which actually uh, m makes the society bit more inclusive and, and just and fair for everybody, especially people with disabilities. And though those who are constituting the bottom most rung, like people who are having mental health issues or people who are blind and severely vision impaired or people with severe disabilities. Thank you so much for your time <laughs> and you know we, we had you uh, we really got to learn so much uh, about you know different contexts and how these contexts uh, inform uh, you know comparison always helps you know, we learn from different contexts and see what's similar what's different what can be done better and um, and so it's it's always you know very productive to have that Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. No. Really you. <laughs> no, like I, I, I'm really uh, happy that, uh, as I mentioned, that I, I would have loved to, uh, to come to, to New York to, uh, to experience the bitter cold and to get a bit more mentally prepared, uh, to, to, he to fly back to Oslo because I'm doing that next Sunday. I'll be, I'll be back in Oslo uh, um, on February 24th. So uh, New York would have been like a, a nice prepping uh, ground, if you will. Uh, and uh, But I think Berkeley is giving me its fair share of uh, chill weather or cold weather. Uh, so that's, uh, that's good. And, um, uh, and, I, and, I've, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're, um, we had such an engaging discussion and, and Stacy and, uh, and other people asked so many such interesting questions. And, and uh, if you want to reach out to me, uh, my email ID is my first name, um, uh, uh, Gagan, G-A-G-A-N. So that's golf, alpha, golf, alpha, Norway, dot, Shabra, C, for Charlie, H for uh, Honduras. Again, another H for Honduras. A for Alpha, B, R, A, Bravo, Romeo, Alpha, at the rate Oslo Met, O, S, L, O, M for Mike, E for Echo, T for Tango, dot N, O for Norway. So, so that, that, that's, that's a way to reach out to me. And, and if you want to read my uh, research article, which I, which I mentioned in passing, uh, you just write my last name, 12, 2018 and uh, and uh, two worlds two apart to converge so two two worlds comma two apart to converge and uh, and and I, and I tell the story of norway and india that how these countries are so apart but still they are converging yeah and uh, yes <laughs>
<laughs> yeah so 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 that's my that's my poetic side uh, i think one of the one of the participants said i i i, I like writing poems and uh, uh in my free time so so that that's the alliteration or like a play on words yeah for sure <gasps> coming uh through yes thank you one uh, thank you for this opportunity thank you everybody for your time and and patience and your questions i really appreciate it thank you yes yes bye bye thank you bye 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 okay done how are you feeling